Case number 1933-42, John Doe versus Oberlin College. Oral argument not to exceed 15 minutes per side. Mr. Muha for the appellant. Good morning. Uh, I'm morning. Chris Muha. I represent uh, John Doe, the plaintiff appellant uh, in this case. Um, I've reserved uh, three minutes for rebuttal. Very well. May it please the court. <clears throat> when schools discriminate on the basis of sex, they violate Title IX, and it doesn't matter if the reason that they're doing so is because they have a permanent ingrained bias against one sex or another, because they want to avoid liability from the federal government who's threatening to yank their funding, or because they genuinely believe that discriminating on the basis of sex is the right thing to do to achieve justice in a particular kind of case. As the Second Circuit noted in Columbia University, and as Judge Barrett recently noted for the Seventh Circuit, that is sex discrimination all the same, and it violates Title IX. And Oberlin, I think, shows us exactly how haywire things can go when schools choose to go that route. At the time period in question here, Oberlin convicted 100% of the students that Dr. Raimondo and her Title IX team sent through its formal process. Even in cases like John Doe's, where the evidence overwhelmingly contradicted the finding that was leveled against him, that decision cries out for an explanation because the evidence can't be what explains it. Well, the only question- you overstated it a little bit, haven't you? Weren't there over 100 <clears throat> complaints and only 20 of those were referred to investigation and only half of those were actually had a hearing? So you're only talking about 10 out of 100. It's not, so that means presumably in the other 90 complaints, a lot of times the males were exonerated, right? I, again, that is, that is potentially what happened, but the question at this stage is what is it plausible to infer? And is there a plausible inference that supports John Doe? I thought, and here, just on the same factual point, I thought your complaint had an allegation to the effect that in 80% of those cases, the complainant chose not to go forward. And so under this policy, the university would not make a determination whether to send it into formal proceedings. That, that is, that's correct, Your Honor. Did you, where in your complaint, do you recall? That is, that is in the campus climate report that is okay. incorporated into enough. the complaint, yes. Uh, that, those statistics come from Oberlin. And in a, in a system that is complainant-centered by, by nature, um, we, it is at least plausible to infer that when a complainant says, I don't want this to go any further, that that's what happens. And then as to the other 10% that didn't go to a formal resolution, the other option at the school is informal resolution. And there too, it is again, at least plausible to infer that when that is what is requested, that is what Oberlin does. So the policy requires that they discuss the express preference of the survivor before deciding what to do. And exhibit one to our complaint recounts an article when the policy was coming out and being discussed at the school, uh, summarizing what Dr. Raimondo had been saying about it and saying that it is, it is indeed up to the students to decide which of these two resolution processes it may go through. So again, discovery will certainly confirm one way or the other what is true, but at this stage it is at least plausible to infer that the only cases that went through formal resolution are where the student asked for that and that it wasn't because Oberlin was, was doing some sort of careful vetting process on the front end. And I think John Doe's case is probably a good, uh, even further evidence of that. Because here, to be found guilty of having forced someone to perform oral sex because she was too incapacitated to consent, it had to be clear to him that she, quote, lacked the rational ability to appreciate the conscious nature of what was going on and or was physically helpless. Those are quotes from Oberlin's policy. And they say likewise that being incapacitated means being unable to control your body, not understanding the who, the what, the when, the where, or the why of what you were doing. And there was absolutely no evidence that could have told John Doe she was in that kind of a state, even if she were. They had 80 minutes of consensual, coherent interaction. Does this all go to the first prong of the test, or does any of this go to the second prong? No, that, thank you. This goes to the second prong as well. And the reason is this, that Substantial departures from the evidence is itself evidence of gender bias. And, and this was just recently clarified in, in, I think, really good detail in the Hofstra University case out of the Second Circuit. So there, Hofstra was just emphasizing what Columbia University had already said 
and what, again, in the equal protection context, Village of Arlington Heights said more than 40 years ago, which is that when you depart substantially from the standards that govern these kinds of decisions, that itself is evidence of bias. And again, I think the intuition there is, if it, the evidence can't be what explains it, there must be something else at work here. And so Hofstra said, when you have this kind of substantial departure from the evidence, you really only need a minimal amount of, say, pressure from the school or other kind of evidence coming from the outside. So there, the plaintiff, or I'm sorry, the, the school, Hofstra, had argued it. Does that mean the resolution of the second prong turns in part on how egregious the That's analysis right. was under the first prong or, or how wrong the, the um, resolution was? That's in other right. words, the, it's a little funny to me because the second part is sort of an institutional approach and the first part of it seems to be sort of in this particular case was the result right. And so I'm not entirely sure how those are connected. I guess if you had a systemic pattern of cases where they were always departing from their settled procedures, that'd be one thing. Um, if in, in a one-off case, if they have, I'm not sure how much that, might be informative a little bit, but I'm not sure that how much that helps on prong two. Right. I, I think, again, the, the question does go in part to the how far that you are departing from the evidence in the case. If, if you think, well, I would quibble with some of how the evidence was analyzed here, then maybe you say this is human nature, this is just bare human error, this isn't evidence of bias per se. But to quote Hofstra, <clears throat> when the evidence substantially favors one party's version of a disputed matter, but an evaluator forms a conclusion in favor of the other side without an apparent reason based in the evidence, it is plausible to infer, although by no means necessarily correct, that the evaluator has been influenced by bias. That's Hofstra? That's Hofstra, right. Which again is getting that from Columbia University, which, you know, again, in this anti-discrimination law in general, this, you know, Village of Arlington Heights sort of first laid out all these kinds of principles. And that, we would submit, is what happened here. There was 80 minutes of consensual activity, including making out and vaginal intercourse, before Jane Rowe said... I ask you about some of the other systemic issues. There's sure. some, there's, part of this case turns on the pressure that might, be, might be, have been placed on the university uh, under Title IX, I think by... Fed, by Department of Education or some federal investigator. Can you, can you just talk about that a little bit? I want to understand that. Yes, absolutely. So, so two sources of pressure that Oberlin was under at the relevant time. First, like every school in the country, it was experiencing the undifferentiated pressure from the federal government to come down hard on especially claims of sexual assault brought by women against men. That is the pressure that was relevant in Miami University. And the reason given for it there was, was precisely that, that if you didn't appease the federal government, schools thought they might literally lose all of their federal funding. Was there something specific to Oberlin? That's sort of what I was... Yes, right. So, so what happens then with Oberlin is, is that targeted pressure, three months before the allegations against John Doe are made, that pressure gets directly targeted upon Oberlin. And they are told, we are going to conduct a systemic investigation of your sexual misconduct practices and how you respond to these kinds of things. And, and Dr. Raimondo had, had already sort of acknowledged this fear. She had said that summer that, you know, in her mind, it was not a matter of if OCR came calling, it was a matter of when. So this kind of pressure that all the schools were under, she was very cognizant of. And as the Seventh Circuit noted, you know, the fact that she is the Title IX coordinator and therefore has responsibility for compliance at the school is reason to think that she may be experiencing that pressure in a way that others at the school don't. She wasn't the Title IX coordinator at the time of the hearing, was she? She was not, no. She, she had wasn't been the, part of the hearing panel, was she? She was not a part of the hearing panel, no. She was in charge of training everyone at the school from 2014, actually from 2013, before this policy was even adopted. She was the coordinator. and She was the coordinator up until, again, you said July 1st of that year. Now, training happens annually at the school. so. On that fact alone, nine of the 12 months in which that panel would have to have been trained would have been under her direct supervision as the Title IX coordinator. Well, she, and she continued as the supervisor of her interim replacement during the time that he was sent forward into formal proceedings. Is that right? That's right. So the decision to, the, the investigative report, you know, the issuance of which triggers that decision, came out six days after she stepped down, or really rather stepped up. And she did continue to supervise her interim replacement, who again, as an interim, I would submit it's not reasonable to think she's going to come in and she's going to change everything that the only Title IX coordinator under that policy had been doing for the last three years. You know, I noticed the district court, what, Judge Solomon was the district judge? 
Uh, Judge Oliver, yes, that's right. Oliver, Judge Oliver. Solomon Oliver, I'm that's sorry, right, right. yes. And, and he found, he agreed with you, I guess, to the point of there was probably enough proof of erroneous outcome here. But he disagreed, obviously, that there was enough to show the Title IX bias that's the second part of the test. Now, what, where do you think he went wrong on that part? I think on a couple things. So I think I think probably most importantly, he, he never actually addressed the the content of Dr. Raimondo's statements. So the other part of the evidence in this case is that Dr. Raimondo, when she was traveling and giving presentations with a group of panelists the summer before these allegations were brought, said that among other things, um, they were talking about what they called the great middle area of cases between where someone is fundamentally incapacitated, you know, passed out, and where someone is being chased down in an alley where, where the question of consent is just obvious. But in, in between there, in, in other words, the vast majority of the cases that schools deal with, she said, I don't think it's appropriate to talk about these cases as being gray areas because that discredits, quote, particularly women's experiences of violence. So what she, do you, I mean, I, I agree that that, well, my sense is that might be the most potentially uh, problematic statement, you know, her statement that she's a feminist, I don't think that's a big deal. Um, but how do you, so how do you translate that into bias in this proceeding or just generally at this school? Right. So what it does at a, at, a, at a high level at least is it shows that when she conceives of consent, she does throw through considerations of gender. And she is the one at the school who is tasked under the policy with training everyone on how to apply the policy's terms of consent and incapacitation. And I think one plausible reading, and again, there may be others, but one plausible reading of this is that, you know, traditionally the old trope is that if a woman doesn't resist to her utmost when she is being attacked, then she must have consented in some way. And I think maybe what she's getting at is saying that we need to get rid of that idea. And I think when you go too far with that, you have a decision exactly like she here. She would be right about that, presumably. A absolutely. But when you say, so, and I think the, the error, though, is in a case like this, what I think, and I, what, what, again, is one plausible way she's doing this, when there is any evidence supporting someone's claim of assault, we have to find a way to, get to, to credit that. Otherwise, we're not doing credit to their experiences of violence. And that is what happened here. There was no evidence whatsoever that John Doe could have known she was physically helpless, unable to make rational decisions for herself. And yet he was found responsible, and he was expelled. That's why it might be an erroneous outcome. But I'm looking, you know, at that panel discussion that everybody's looking at for Dr. Raimondo. She makes the following, that what are the spaces, for example, for men to come forward and report gender-based harms? When, are our procedure, uh, when our procedures assume that women are the only people who report, we shut down that space even further. So, I mean, that's begin I mean, that doesn't sound like she's biased in favor of always finding men guilty. Not in favor, maybe not always favor, but, but putting a thumb on the scale against one side or the other because of bias, whether it's racial or sexual bias. Right, I guess that's, my question is, what, what is your, sort of makes that plausible as opposed to just speculative? What makes it plausible, Your Honor, is that she herself has said, I bring considerations of gender to bear when I think about consent. And we have a decision here that seems to reflect that. So the decision itself, not only because it substantially departs from the evidence, but because of the way that it does so, marries up with this idea, again, one plausible way to interpret it. And, and I would submit if, if, if you have 53 pages of briefing and no alternative explanation of what this statement could mean, and they have the benefit of talking to Dr. Raimondo, they could have gone to her and said, what did you mean by this? And then put it into a brief and said, here's one other way that you could read this. Right? And that silence, I think, is very telling. One question before you sit down. What was the role of Bautista, Dean Bautista? This was an advocate appointed by the university? Yeah, so, so at, at most schools, including at Oberlin, uh, students who go into these processes are allowed to have an advisor. And if you don't bring your own, the school will often appoint one for you. So by, no, don't bring your own, in other words, is that typically a lawyer? At this time, yes. Um, that is now required by federal law that students be permitted to bring a lawyer into the process. But again, many students you know, are not able to do that. John Doe did not do that when he was at his hearing. Dean Bautista works at the school and is someone- A little who, bit like appointed counsel in a criminal case, not exactly, but, but so, very, so this person is appointed to represent, I and mean, what does the advocate do? What is literally, it's there to advise, not, not permitted to speak at the hearing, but is there to sort of, any questions that the either party has, they can talk with their advisor, they can take breaks. Um, having done this myself, I, you know, typically we are listening for uh, questions that we might be able to submit, you know, on uh, when the time comes to do that. 
Um, but at the hearing itself, the role is, is fairly limited, but still pretty critical because there are times when testimony differs as it, as it did here, uh, where the only critical change that anyone made was, was made by Jane Rowe. And in situations like that, it, it is very helpful to have an advisor. The change you're talking about is a change from what she told the investigator to what she said at the hearing with respect to whether she was physically coerced in this act? That's correct, Your Honor. And did the board have any comment? Uh, and a, a, a close friend of hers tried to submit a note or something to the board disputing what her change? Is that right? On, a, on appeal, that's right. Um, on this appeal. Was, yes. A, her best friend, who she asked to accompany to her interview, said, like, I was at the interview. He, he first of all said, like, I... She told me something different than even she said at the interview. But of note, what he said is she, she never made any allegation of force. And she said he asked. And at the hearing, she was directly asked, did he ask you to perform oral sex? And she said no. And on that, if I could add one more thing to that, that is the only disputed question of fact here that the board actually made a finding on, whether she, whether she was asked or whether she didn't. And as we talk about in paragraph 157, the decision in this case said there was not consent when asked to perform oral sex. They actually have to find Jane Roe effectively not credible in order to convict John Doe. Uh, did, they, did the board have any comment in its opinion um, as to uh, regarding this, this alleged change in her story from what she told the investigator to what she told the board? Did they have any comment on that? No, Your Honor. The word force, the allegation of force is nowhere in the complaint, and again, the exact opposite, right? The predicate of her allegation of force was that there was never a question, and they come out the opposite on that point. Okay, thanks. You'll have your rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court, Aaron Herzig for Appley Oberlin College. Uh, Title IX requires colleges to adopt policies and procedures to address sexual misconduct and to administer those policies and procedures in a uh, manner without gender bias. That's exactly what Oberlin did here. Uh, do you, uh, do you contest Dauberg at all the first prong, uh, erroneous for, outcome? For the purposes of the stage that we are in, uh, no, we are not contesting the right. first prong. I do have, though, uh, a number of uh, things to say about the presentation uh, we just heard, including about the pleading standard. Uh, one of the things that was just suggested is that we could have simply asked Dr. Raimondo uh, a certain number of questions. Well, of course, we're at the motion to dismiss yeah. so we can't do that. Dr. Bautista, who you ask about, uh, Your Honor, uh, they uh, do not address the uh, issue of Dr. Bautista in any of their briefings, so I think they've uh, forfeited or uh, for, forfeited and waived that point for this purpose. Is it in the complaint? Uh, it is in the complaint, but I, they have not raised it as an issue in front of this court as one of the factors that you should consider. More importantly, though, Your Honor, the policy uh, that is facially neutral, that they did not put into the record, that, that we did in our motion to dismiss briefing, at page 33 of the policy says that a student may choose their advisor. They can pick somebody from a list of the school. They can take someone who is appointed. They can bring a lawyer who can't act as a lawyer but can act as an advisor. So uh, this student had the opportunity to pick anybody uh, that he wanted at page 33 of the policy. And uh, uh, he, so to the idea that uh, there was some problem with uh, Dr. Well, did, he, did he pick this person or was this person appointed by the university? Uh, uh, as the allegation, I, I believe this person was appointed. Right, so student. the university has some obligation to uh, appoint someone who will, add, who will work in that person's best interest, I assume. Be a good yes. option, in other words, as opposed to having to pay a lawyer. Sure, but I, 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 I agree with that. But uh, the, we're talking about whether the policy... Whether right, so, was so the university has a policy. The university has a policy. Right. The policy says that we'll appoint someone for you if you don't pick someone. The university appoints someone, and so the university has some obligation, I think, to make sure that that person is operating in the best interest of the student. Isn't that, isn't that right? Uh, yes, and I don't think there's any allegation that he Well, there's a just, he just tweet afterwards about to survivors everywhere, we believe you. Uh, yes, Your Honor, and I don't. And survivors, of course, can be male or female. Uh, there is no. Well, he, well, well, I mean, he in the hearing he was advising the person who's being accused by the survivor. And there's no allegation that any of his advice was problematic. But uh, I mean, the fact that something, uh, I, it was, I think, Ms. Raimundo appoints a person who, I mean, I'm, who's, who would say that. Um, uh, might itself be evidence of bias uh, in, the, in this very proceeding. 
I disagree, Your Honor, that that would be. Yeah, but it's 12B6. You know, I mean, we take a, you know, favorable to them view. It still has to be plausibly pled, Your Honor, and so you would expect to see something That's like That's one thing. And, and Dr. Bautista uh, gave me bad advice. There's no allegation. Well, it's one thing. I, those lines. I mean, w one thing I'll say is um, <clears throat> there sometimes seems to be in, in the briefing or perhaps inadvertently in the district court opinion kind of a silo type analysis where just focusing on one factor, one piece of evidence that they, they cite and saying, that's not enough, and then you go to the next one. That's not enough, and there's never sort of a sense of, well, let, let's look at this collectively, which is what we're supposed to do, and does this get us over the line to, to plausibility, you know, just for purposes of 12b-6? I, I, I agree, and I would encourage you to look at it uh, uh, holistically, Your Honor. Now, what, what Appellant advocates uh, and claims that Columbia University and Hofstra say is that there's some kind of sliding scale approach. You don't see that in any of the case law. The cases in this circuit, uh, I think you've got four cases that really matter in this circuit. I think, I think what he's saying, and you can tell me why you think it's unreasonable, is there's a certain threshold that one has to, to meet to satisfy the first prong, and you're not even contesting that prong here. but but. There can be a, a marginal difference. The, 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 the allegations, the proof can suggest a degree of egregiousness that goes far beyond the showing necessary to the first prong. And when that marginal difference is great enough, uh, that difference itself can be evidence of bias in the particular proceeding. I mean, what's so contrary to common sense about that? Well, I, I, I think, if, I, I think uh, that would be a departure from what this court has done and what other courts have done. Erroneous outcome is one piece of it. Right. We, we don't expect colleges to get it right every time. Well, suppose, our, is, suppose our precedent doesn't preclude this. <laughs> why, why is that an unreasonable inference? It's just about inferences. Uh, well, it, it's more, it, it's about plausible pleading, Your Honor, and that, that, yeah, is, why more, isn't it that plausible? is more than si simply an inference. Uh, and it's implausible because the question is, was this particular proceeding uh, uh, biased against this man uh, in, this, in this particular case. Well, let me, so, let well, me ask you a question. Incapacitation, the university standard, it says um, the individual cannot make an informed and rational decision to engage in sexual activity because, in other words, for this particular reason, they lack conscious knowledge of the nature of the act or they're physically helpless. Examples of that in this, this are they're asleep, unconscious, un otherwise unaware that sexual activity is occurring. How is that standard met here uh, on the allegations in the complaint? Um, does the complainant lack conscious knowledge of the nature of the sexual act? Is she asleep, unconscious, unaware that sexual activity is occurring? H how, do you, how do you reconcile the record, at least as they allege it, with your own standard? Uh, Your Honor, what the panel found was that uh, essentially when she said, uh, I'm not sober, that consent ended at that point. And I think what's really important as to that second prong, which that, is- That satisfies this standard? I, I, yeah, yes, Your Honor, that's what the, that's what, that's what the panel the found, is that this, she no longer had conscious knowledge. The whole point of the standard is consent. that you're not able to give consent or not give consent, because you're incapacitated. So if, you, if you're even having that discussion, it seems to completely cut against the idea that you're incapacitated which I've just been totally confused about this, the standard that the university's adopted. I think that overstates it a little bit, Your Honor, because I think when someone says, says no, uh, that, that, that ends consent. What, well, this isn't about consent. This is well, about the inability to even give consent or not give consent right, because they lack consciousness. It's the lack of conscious knowledge. Uh, are, you really, exactly. are you really saying that this is a lack of conscious knowledge of the nature of the sexual event? After they, I, I, well, I mean, this is in a 50 or whatever hour long encounter. Are you saying there was no knowledge of the nature of the event? Really? So, so your, your Honor, that's, that's what the panel found, number one. Number two, okay, but the we're, we're, not, we're yeah. not there yet, Your Honors. Well, I, I mean, but the point because, is, because the, if, that, if that is extremely hard to reconcile with the evidence at least alleged in the complaint, maybe there was a problem. Your Honors, the, the question on that second prong is whether there was bias, whether this was, there was gender bias here. Their evidence of that 
uh, is all about the first prong, whether the outcome was not, wrong. Not all about that. Not, not all about well, well, I think it was, Your Honor. I, I would about the 100 percent conviction rate? Now, you say that doesn't matter because 80 percent of the time it doesn't go forward. But my understanding of the record here is that eight, uh, or 90 percent of the time it doesn't go forward. My understanding of the record, and you know, you have to sort of take their complaint as you find it, is that in 80 percent of the cases, the complainant does not want action. And so that is the reason, not the school's own judgment. That's the reason it doesn't go forward. We're not going to put that in the denominator in, judge, in determining whether when the university does make a decision, they're being fair, right? I, I, I point to Your Honor. Your Honor. Right? Is that, I mean, would you, would you put the 80 percent where the well, school's not making a decision? Is that relevant? In the, is that in the denominator? I, I, think, I, I do think it's overstating it to say it has no relevance. I think this, Why? Is, all, this is all part of a Title IX process, and if in that process, uh, students decide not to come forward. I think you. No, they come you, forward, but they choose not well, to have act, take action right, so for whatever I, I, reason. I think Why do you get credit for their decision not to take action? Uh, uh, you're being fair to the accused. I don't really track that. I would argue, Your Honor, that the title that means the the Title IX program is uh, starting to weed out real complaints from, from from not real complaints, and so I think you do give it some credit. I'm, the, I'm, I understand. It's alleged to be the complainant's decision, not your weeding out. But uh, understood. And I and I would point you to the idea that only 50 percent of, investi of, of, of okay. investigations end, end up in hearing. But how about a hundred percent conviction rate? Every well, single person who goes in there, nobody comes out. I so, mean, is that do we is that just irrelevant or? Together with some of these other things, does that allow somebody to infer that maybe there's at least a thumb on the scale, even if it's all well-intentioned? Um, I, I, I don't think that's what these facts add up to, Your Honor. I think if you look at Miami University as an example, that's a strong contrast to what we have here, where uh, they were moving everyone from complaint through uh, investigation to hearing and uh, finding of responsibility. Uh, we don't have those facts here. I think this fits more squarely in cases from the circuit like Dayton and Cummins. Um, Miami University and Baum both, by the way, talk about, and, and, and I'd like to talk about for a minute, uh, the idea that you need a particularized causal connection to this particular uh, case. What is it here that says that, uh, uh, that we got it wrong, not because we, we got it wrong, but because of gender bias. How about there, the there is none of they the, don't even comment on the change in the story? Isn't that, or, that, that would seem to be similar to Baum, where uh, the university uh, discredits the fraternity brothers because of that relationship with the accused, but they believe the sorority sisters, notwithstanding a similar relationship. Just sort of an oddity. Yeah, yeah. Now, isn't that, isn't that an oddity that the board would not even comment on a rather important change? A couple of things, Your Honor. First of all, uh, they credit and discredit testimony from witnesses for both sides, men and women. That, that's pled. Men and women, uh, the reporting party and the responding party, uh, they, they, don't make, they don't credit her testimony regarding force. Um, they don't. They didn't. No, that, that, that's, or they, that, they just don't decide on that ground. I right. Guess. Well, that's that's the same as not crediting it. I think. But they don't even comment. I mean, well, you know, if one is assessing the credibility of a witness, you know, typically it's that it that too is sort of a holistic assessment. And if somebody has this rather dramatic change in their story from the 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 story that's in the complaint itself, what was told to, to the investigator, I mean, normally one might comment on that in determining whether this is a credible accusation. Here, Your Honor, I think the lack of comment, the lack of deciding on that uh, basis uh, speaks volumes. Uh, it certainly is a dramatic contrast to Baum and Miami and cases like that where you're absolutely right. Uh, you, you credit only male testimony. You credit only uh, the, reporting, the reporting party. Or in Purdue, uh, the Judge Barrett case that, the, that uh, my colleague talked about where um, there's um, uh, crediting only the testimony of one party, not calling the reporting party to testify live. Can I ask you another procedural question about this case that sure. might speak to broader policies? There was an appeal. I think some of the things Judge Kethledge was asking about were part of an appeal where one of the main people, with, primary people with information, her friend changed, said that, that the accuser changed her story. And it looked like the appeal was rejected sort of formalistically. Um, I mean, was it, 
How does that appeal? So does everyone get a right to an appeal? Uh, yes, they have. Uh, there are standards for the right to appeal, including bringing up new evidence. Uh, and so new evidence, new evidence. There, can, can, can I finish? Sorry. Um, new evidence was brought up here, and it looked like it was sort of rubber stamped. I don't, I'm sure. I'm not sure what the if there's how thorough that appeal is, or can you tell me sort of how that process works? Well, I, I don't think it was rubber stamped, Your Honor, but uh, this wasn't new evidence. This is all evidence. Okay, can, you tell me how the, can you just tell me how the process works? Can you just answer sure. that? Uh, he's entitled to an appeal shortly after the decision. Uh, an appeal officer uh, looks at the, the nature of the appeal and the three factors and makes uh, a determination whether the, the appeal should go. Is there a hearing? Uh, no, Your Honor. And um, is the 100% rate carry over to the appeal? Pro I mean, in other words, has, has, has there ever been appeal granted? I, I don't know, Your Honor. Um, what is the advisor, that advisor particular person, what, what, is that per, what was that person's role at the university at the time? Uh, it, Dean, Dean, ba Dean Bautista, Your Honor. Um, the per who, uh, who was the advisor? That Dean, was, Dean, Dean Bautista was the advisor. Who, the again, again they, they don't raise her or in, herself. In I don't know if it was a man or a woman. Uh, but, okay, so it was the dean of the university. A, 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 a dean of a college, not the dean of the entire okay. university. Well, um, um, all right. A, well, a dean of what college? I, I, I don't have that at All right, we can chase that down. The, um, uh, in part because they don't address it in their appeal briefs at all, which to me is forfeiture of that issue is one of the ones well, that, you, we should, can sort that, that you should consider. You know, just on um, a totally different topic, you know, the, the district court also dismissed the state law claims of negligence, breach of contract for, for you know, on supplementary jury, but there was diversity. Here. So is the district court at least wrong on that? Would we have to remand at least for the state law claims? We, we miss that, Your Honor. Um, the, the, way, the way it's pled, they, play, they, they, there is, uh, they, they plead federal jurisdiction, diversity jurisdiction in one paragraph, and then the next one say there is supplemental jurisdiction over the state law claims under 1367. Uh, and so I think uh, all sides uh, miss that in two motion to dismiss rounds of briefing. Um, that said, seven was a head fake, I guess. The, it, was, it was in the complaint, Your Honor. Um, yeah. The um, uh, what, I, what I would also say about that, though, Your Honor, is that those things, those claims, basically follow on. They are fully briefed below. Uh, it is de novo review. So, if uh, Your Honors wanted to, I think you could you could reach that. But 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 yes, I think we all missed that. Um, if I, I'm sorry, but can I ask you about the federal investigation uh, by OCR? So, your friend on the other side described. Uh, sort of three months before, I think, the resolution of this case, the university was put on notice that it was sort of under the spotlight um, from OCR. Do you dispute any of that? Is that? Yes, Your Honor, for a couple reasons. One, I don't think they were under the spotlight. They were one of a handful of universities. Uh, the one article they cite to talks about a number of other universities that were under investigation. They received a special communication from OCR that not every university was receiving. They, they had, Your Honor. One thing I would also say, though, is I would encourage you to watch the, uh, the video of Dr. Raimondo again and the Yale, the Yale Magazine transcript, because uh, some of what's represented here uh, doesn't well, tell I, the whole I mean, story. Did you, did, I don't For know, example, did you, are, you, are you answering my question still? Or I, I am. Okay. Uh, on, on that point, Your Honor, um, uh, my, my colleague uh, suggests that um, uh, Dr. Raimondo was concerned about OCR. In fact, what she says mm -hmm. with uh, the head of OCR sitting next to her is, we welcome that kind of investigation. We're trying to do this right. So to the extent we're talking about what was in Dr. Raimondo's head about whether these investigations were important, she says in the panel discussion, not that she's concerned about it, but that she welcomes it, she thinks it'll help them do better. So I don't think it's a particular, uh, I mean, we're talking about her, what's subjectively in her head. I guess we can agree it's in her head uh, at the time. Uh, well, well, sure, Your Honor, every Title IX coordinator. I mean, what's also in their heads is all of the suits challenging. I mean, right there is a bevy of these suits that, that push both ways at this point. You know, I must say that um, one aspect of the red brief in this case made me think that uh, it perhaps was telling. And, and on, the evident, on the question of incapacitation, the red brief, your brief, <laughs> nothing personal, um, but the red brief does seem to cherry pick some of the testimony, uh, particularly the part about she wasn't speaking in coherent sentences and the other one about she was out of it. I mean, those same witnesses, if you look at the totality of their evidence, there's a lot of other stuff there that would seem to be quite favorable to them. And to argue to us on a 12B6, this sort of cherry-picked, you know, she, they, she said the complainant was out of it, 
and we're going to run with that and affirm a 12B6 dismissal. I mean, that's just fundamentally contrary to what we do on 12B6. And why isn't that kind of telling about, you know, the, the, the challenges you face in this appeal? I, 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 I don't think that is what you do, Your Honor, in these cases. I think even Baum and even Miami, which are their best cases, do not say uh, that at this stage you look at how good or bad the outcome was. They look at whether there was gender bias. Well, we don't, and, and that, we don't, you know, but you're really not answering the question because we don't cherry pick testimony and read it in the light most favorable to the defendant. That's what you're doing in your brief. You look at that testimony in the light most favorable to you. And it's the opposite of what we're supposed to do. Now, maybe it's not a huge deal, uh, those particular witnesses, but it's just, it, it's not what we do on 12b-6. I, 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 I was not attempting to evade your question. <coughs> oh, I know, I know. I, I'm not attributing anything and, and, bad to you. And, and what, I, it's just, what, what you my know, answer is, is that... Uh, that's your hand, it's your hand. Yeah, but... but in terms of cards, you know. Oh no, I, I, I understood. The, um, um, the 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 point is that um, all of that goes to whether the outcome was erroneous. What we haven't had a chance to talk about here is what bias infected this proceeding. And in every case you've seen, Baum, Miami. Uh, any of the number of cases that they would cite, everyone in cited in Baum, there was a particularized. Uh, bias on behalf of a panel member or something in the procedure where, as you point There's out, something they believe one, not the, the other. Case. There yeah. is none of that here. They now, may have gotten it wrong, now, That's, but, but that isn't good enough uh, to survive a 12B6 in these kinds of Title IX cases. Okay. No, I, I appreciate that. Um, we have gone a ways over. Uh, are there any more questions? All right. Uh, I, I would, if I may just yes. close briefly, Your Honor. Uh, Oberlin, Take 30 seconds. Uh, Oberlin... Uh, uh, Oberlin's job is to care for all of its students, and it, it does that uh, through an unbiased uh, process that attempts to get it right. Uh, its job is not to get it right every time. Its job is to be unbiased, and we think it did it here, and that Judge Oliver got it right. So we ask that you affirm. Thank all you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Herzig. We will hear rebuttal. I'd like to address uh, two things. First, I want to briefly talk about whether Dr. Raimondo welcomed an OCR investigation. I think if that's true Whether that she what? Whether she welcomed an OCR investigation, the, the pressure from the Raimondo firm. may not be the strongest part of your case. I mean, I know it gets a lot of airtime, but you go ahead with what you I, want. I don't, I, don't, I don't fully disagree, Your Honor. I, I'll just say that if, if she did, in fact, welcome an OCR that was pressuring schools to resolve these cases a certain way, I think that only suggests more bias in the process, not less, if she's already sort of on board with pressure that, in other cases, is evidence of gender bias. Um, I'm glad to hear um, Oberlin say that the panel did not rely on an allegation of force, as they said exp explicitly on page 47 of their brief. And I think that goes to, again, some of your other questions about the evidence of incapacity here and whether anything close to that definition was satisfied. And just to start with that, her allegation there of force. Her allegation was that she grabbed her head and forced it onto his penis and that she physically resisted to the point that it hurt her neck. So she knew what was happening, she knew she didn't want it to happen, allegedly, and she tried to resist it. That in itself, I think, proves that she was not incapacitated. So again, Oberlin, the panel actually had to find her not credible in order to get the result in this case. And there is a lot of other evidence, too, showing that she fully understood the nature of what was happening. And I'll just point you to one. It's paragraph 98. It's her own investi investigation testimony saying that the sex, the vaginal intercourse they were having was painful and that the reason she asked him to stop was because she was dry down there. And this is when she says, I'm not sober. So she knows what's going on. She knows it's not painful. She knows why, and she explains why to him. Well, I think we're all in agreement, sort of, that there was an erro enough to get by erroneous outcome. It's the second part of the test. But was, what particularized facts here tend to show it's plausible that there was gender bias. That's what your hurdle is here, right? Uh, I, so I would, I would dispute first as a, as a legal matter whether there has to be something in the outcome itself showing that kind of bias. And I think Lynn University is probably the best example of that that Baum relied on as providing sufficient evidence of bias. But here, the rationale itself, as divorced as it is from the actual evidence, is exactly the kind of bias, of, of evidence of bias in the actual proceeding here. And again, sort of to analogize it to Judge Barrett's decision, there she said the strongest piece of evidence of bias was the decision to credit one side over another. 
Now, someone in Oberlin's shoes would say, well, that's just pro-complainant bias. That's not pro, that's not gender bias. But it didn't, there was no good basis for doing it because they hadn't seen her. And so again, one plausible reading, even if there are others, is that it was gender bias. The same I would submit is true for this decision. It is so far divorced from the facts that one plausible reading of why, even if there are others, is gender bias. That is all the court has to decide, and all Mr. Doe asks is for discovery to go and find out if that's the case. Thank Very you. well. Uh, thank you both for your arguments.